I'm excited to let you know that early bird registration for our first ever in-person event, Adapt Live, is now open. This is a chance for us to come together as a community to connect, relax, recharge, laugh, play, and celebrate this amazing life that we get to live over Labor Day weekend at the Snowbird Resort in the pristine mountains of Utah, one of the most beautiful and breathtaking places in the world. Here's a sneak peek of what you can look forward to at the event. Three days and three nights of accommodations at the iconic Snowbird Cliff Lodge. Three chef-made nutrient-dense meals a day, plus snacks with gluten-free and dairy-free options. Morning meditation and movement, guided nature hikes, and music with new programming still being added. A special keynote with me. Access to the Cliff Spa with special discounts for retreat attendees and plenty of unstructured time to relax and enjoy the inspiring surroundings. Spots will be limited in order to preserve a retreat-like atmosphere, and we expect the event to sell out quickly. During this early bird enrollment period, you can get early access to lower pricing and great room options. So if you think you may want to join us, head over to cresser.co slash adapt live, all one word, that's A-D-A-P-T-L-I-V-E, to learn more and secure your spot. I hope to see you at Snowbird in September. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This week we're going to do another research review episode. So I recorded the first one of these a few weeks ago and we got a lot of great feedback about it. So I am considering making it a regular feature. So the first study is about milk and MS. The study was called Antibody Cross-Reactivity Between Casein and Myelin-Associated Glycoprotein Results in Central Nervous System Demyelination. Woo! That's a mouthful. And it was published in PNAS. I think this is a really important study because the researchers found that casein, which is a protein in cow's milk, can trigger inflammation in the myelin sheath around the nerves in the brain. So if you think about our brain or our nervous system as a bundle of wires, which it kind of is, the myelin sheath is like the insulation around those wires, and it helps prevent short circuits, so to speak, and also helps with conduction of nerve impulses. And the researchers suspected that the reason this happened was molecular mimicry. So what this means is that the body produces antibodies to casein, which is the protein in milk, for whatever reason in people with MS, and and I would argue other autoimmune diseases at times, I'll come back to that, see this casein protein as a foreign invader, as something that should not be present, and it produces antibodies against that protein in a similar way that our body would produce antibodies against a virus or bacteria or something else that is pathogenic and doesn't belong. But the antibodies that are produced against this casein protein also end up attacking proteins in the myelin sheath around the nerves. So that's, that's this uh, phenomenon of molecular mimicry where antibodies that are produced originally against one compound or antigen end up cross-reacting and attacking um, our own self-tissue. And this can happen with gluten. Uh, That's probably where molecular mimicry is is best known uh, in cases of celiac disease or non-celiac wheat or gluten intolerance. But this study shows that it's also happening with milk proteins in people with multiple sclerosis. So this is, I think, really interesting in light of Terry Walls' work and also uh, AIP, the autoimmune protocol. Those of you that are familiar with this know that Uh, in the autoimmune disease community, particularly in the functional medicine, functional health, and ancestral health spaces, there's been a protocol, a dietary protocol for addressing these conditions that's been around for many years. Sometimes it's referred to as AIP, or that's that's one protocol, autoimmune protocol. Um, Dr. Terry Walls, who suffered from MS herself, and uh, made a remarkable recovery, also has her own version of this diet. And uh, it involves removing all dairy products from the diet, as well as other foods like peppers, uh, nightshades, nuts and seeds, uh, grains, legumes, etc. Because all of these foods either can trigger gut issues that disrupt the immune system, or they can cause antibody production, which then triggers this molecular mimicry phenomenon that we're talking about right now. There has been some published peer-reviewed research supporting AIP, 
Uh, in fact, I've had Dr. Walls on the podcast a few times to talk about her groundbreaking research in this area. But beyond Dr. Walls's work and a few other papers, there hasn't been a lot of formal research supporting AIP and um, you know r- removal of dairy products for people with autoimmune disease. So this this study adds to that, and and in particular for for patients with multiple sclerosis, suggests that consuming uh, dairy proteins may actually exacerbate the condition or even contribute to it developing in the first place. Although that's not uh, that was not studied in this study, and and I have. Some questions about that. So I just want to mention a couple things here. The first is that uh, while this study does show that dairy proteins can contribute or to or exacerbate MS, it does not suggest that dairy proteins are harmful for everybody. That's an important distinction. It's tempting to come to that conclusion, uh, but that is not at all what this study suggests. There may be features with people with autoimmune disease that make them susceptible to this kind of molecular mimicry uh, from dairy proteins that people who do not have autoimmune disease don't have. And and it may even be particularly specific to people with MS. So uh, remember, with diet, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. And, you know, there are always people who say, this food is bad for everybody, uh, that food is good for everybody, and, you know, certainly there are, we, we can say that sugar, refined sugar and flour and industrial seed oils and foods like that are bad for everybody. Uh, and, and certain foods are good for everybody, but there's a limited number of those. And when it comes to choosing the best diet for ourselves as individuals, there really is no one size fits all approach. And it's important to consider a, a whole bunch of different variables and also do a lot of experimentation to find that that best diet for you. Nevertheless, I think this is a very interesting study and it contributes to a lot of anecdotal evidence and and some uh, published peer-reviewed evidence suggesting that dairy proteins and dairy products in general may not be a good idea for people with autoimmune disease. Okay, uh, the next study looked at rates of prediabetes in teens over the last two decades. It's called Trends in Prediabetes Among Youths in the U.S. from 1999 to 2018, and it was published in JAMA Pediatrics. So the statistics in this study are, uh, frankly, quite alarming. They suggest that one in five teens now have prediabetes. So just let that sink in for a moment. One in five teens now has prediabetes. This is a horrific failure of public health. We know from a huge body of evidence that people with prediabetes progress to full-fledged type 2 diabetes at an annualized rate of 5 to 10%, and that 70% of individuals that are diagnosed with prediabetes will eventually develop diabetes. So this makes it extremely likely that without intervention, if someone is diagnosed with diabetes as a teenager, that they will almost certainly go on to develop full-fledged type 2 diabetes and probably quite early in their life, uh, given the statistics that I just mentioned. This is a huge problem because we know that people with type 2 diabetes have a higher risk of heart and blood vessel damage and heart attacks, nerve damage, kidney damage, eye damage, foot damage, Uh, They develop osteoporosis at a higher rate, they have a a decreased quality of life, and they have a much higher risk of Alzheimer's and dementia later in life. If you recall from the first research review, I shared a study that suggested that our blood glucose levels as early as age 35 will predict our Alzheimer's disease risk later in life. And uh, if, if a growing number of teens are being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, at that age, uh, then imagine what that's going to do to the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 years later in their life. So the researchers in this paper did not speculate on the cause of these increased rates of prediabetes in teens, but I, I will speculate on it. If you look at other studies, you see that the average American and I would extend this to other industrialized countries. It's not quite uh, as bad, but it's, it's you know, they're catching up. 
The average American gets 60% of their calories from ultra-processed foods. Not just processed foods, ultra-processed foods. So these are highly refined foods like, you know, pizza, cookies, crackers, cakes, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages, um, you know, all of the processed and refined junk that you get at, um, at, you see a lot of fast food restaurants and convenience stores and things like this. These sources now comprise more than half of the calories that that people eat and um, this is true for teenagers as well it may be even more true for teenagers i haven't seen um, specific studies on on the percentage of calories from ultra processed foods in this age group but there are definitely uh, uh, trends in in food consumption in teens that i think match or exceed what we see in adults so that's one problem is is diet a huge problem. Number two is lack of physical activity. So studies have shown that school-age children, including teens, are sedentary for eight or more of their daily waking hours on average, and most are, accessing, are, are engaging in excessive screen time. So sedentary time is, is a unique problem. It's not just lack of exercise or physical activity. Uh, someone could exercise for a half hour a day, but if they're still, uh, if they're sedentary for the rest of, of, the, of that day, then there's still going to be an increased risk uh, of diseases like type 2 diabetes. It's not enough just to get, you know, a short period of exercise each day. If you're sitting for an extremely long period of the day, then that uh, confers its own unique risk. And I've, I've written and talked a lot about this over the years. And I'm sure this isn't the first time you're hearing about it, but it's definitely, in my mind, a, a contributor to this increase in, in prediabetes risk in teens. The third cause of this, you know, in, in my estimation, is lack of sleep. So we know that there's now an epidemic of sleep deprivation in teenagers, uh, which is in part caused by excessive screen use, um, bringing phones into the bedroom, uh, texting during, during the night, but also just busier schedules, you know, more activities, more homework, and just general trends. If a teen is not getting enough sleep, we know that sleep deprivation, even a single night of sleep, depriva sleep deprivation can cause insulin resistance the next day, it can cause an increase in food intake, it can cause a decrease in judgment around food choices, um, and that's just from one night. So imagine what happens over an extended period of not getting enough sleep. You put all of those three factors together, extremely poor nutrition, high rates of sedentary time, and then an epidemic of sleep deprivation, then that can certainly explain this alarming increase in prediabetes in kids. Uh, and teens, and this is something that I'm really passionate about. We need to get our act together here. It's one thing with adults. It's obviously a very bad pattern with adults, but with kids, uh, we're setting them up for a lifetime of, of suffering and, and chronic disease, and that's just not okay. So uh, hopefully this can be a wake-up call, and we can really make some progress towards uh, supporting teens in making better choices. Along similar lines, the next study looked at how sleep deprivation increases abdominal fat. It's called uh, Effects of Experimental Sleep Restriction on Energy Intake, Energy Expenditure, and Visceral Obesity, and it was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. So this was a randomized controlled crossover study, which is a, a really great study design, uh, kind of gold standard, and they found that lack of sufficient sleep led to a 9% increase in total abdominal fat area and 11% increase in abdominal visceral fat uh, compared to getting enough sleep. Now again, as I just mentioned, this is a huge issue because such a large percentage of people now don't get enough sleep. So the most recent statistics suggest that a third of Americans get fewer than six hours of sleep. That's up from just a few percent back in the 1960s. So this has been a a trend over the past 50 years that's getting worse and worse. I want to read you a quote from Dr. Virend Summers, who is the lead author of the study. Quote, Our findings show that shortened sleep, even in young, healthy, and relatively lean subjects, 
is associated with an increase in calorie intake, a very small increase in weight, and a significant increase in fat accumulation inside the belly. This suggests that inadequate sleep is a previously unrecognized trigger for visceral fat deposition and that catch-up sleep, at least in the short term, does not reverse the visceral fat accumulation. In the long term, these findings implicate inadequate sleep as a contributor to the epidemics of obesity, cardiovascular, and metabolic diseases. So I want to highlight one part of that quote that I think is especially important, which is that catch-up sleep does not reverse the visceral fat accumulation. So what he means by that is, let's say you go three, four weeks without getting enough sleep, you're particularly sleep deprived, and then in the you you accumulate some visceral or abdominal fat during that period. And then for the next three or four weeks, you try to make up for that sleep deprivation by sleeping a little bit extra. What this study suggests is that that extra catch-up sleep does not actually reverse the abdominal fat accumulation. Now, I'm not saying this to scare you uh, because... Look, there are situations in life where we, you know, it might not always be possible to get as much sleep as we want. You know, some traumatic event, car accident, illness, uh, or, or just, you know, a particularly difficult time at work. Or if you're an entrepreneur, you know, <laughs> something related to your own business. There are many different reasons that people may go a period of time without getting enough sleep. So... The idea here is not to make us feel guilty about that uh, and, and things that we can't control. I mention this because there, are, in many cases, the amount of sleep we get comes down to choices that we do make and that we do have control over. So, you know, staying up late, browsing the internet, you know, watching TV, uh, just not making it a priority to get into bed early and, and get, you know, seven or eight hours of sleep that's a far more common cause of not getting enough sleep, at least in, in the U.S. and other developed countries. And I hope that this study shows how important it is to get that sleep, because if we don't, that visceral abdominal fat accumulation can, can start and may not be easily reversible. Uh, that's one of the key findings of this study. So, it's just really important to continue to make sleep a very high priority in our life and to protect that against a lot of the <laughs> encroaching threats to sleep, particularly screen time, uh, as, as I've discussed a lot before. Using screens uh, really close to bed can suppress melatonin production and um, give us that sort of nighttime second wind that a lot of people experience and then make it less likely that we'll go to bed in the first place. So it's really important as a starting place to prioritize sleep, make enough time for sleep, make it a, a huge priority in your life. And then second, to follow good sleep hygiene practices. So we, in the last research review, we talked about a study showing that even moderate light exposure during uh, nighttime sleep can increase insulin resistance the next day. So that's a good example where, you know, we want to sleep in a cool, dark room. We want to, you know, get rid of anything that emits light, like a digital alarm clock or a phone. Um, you can have a, a night light with a amber or red tint if you need some, you know, to be able to see to get up and go to the bathroom or something like that. Uh, we want to, you know, not use screens uh, within an hour of bed. We want to make sure that our sleep environment is quiet. Uh, so yeah, all the things that we've talked about in the past, that's the best way to do it and make sure that we get enough sleep. I've been a huge fan of Thrive Market since they launched. I love having my favorite healthy products shipped right to my door at a fraction of the price I'd pay elsewhere. I use Thrive to order not only pantry staples like coconut milk, dark chocolate, and collagen peptides, but also toxin-free personal and household products. So I'm super excited that all of you can now get 40% off your first order and a free gift worth over $50 when you join Thrive Market today. Thrive makes it easy to find what you're looking for, whether that's paleo, low-carb or keto, or gluten-free. You can filter by 90-plus values and lifestyles to find what works for you. Can your grocery store do that? Now it can when you go to thrivemarket.com slash revolutionhealth. Join today and get 40% off your first order and a free gift worth over $50. That's 
thrivemarket.com slash revolution health to get 40% off your first order and a free gift worth over $50. So the next study looked at cases of cognitive decline in older people and found that they've doubled in the last 10 years. So this study was called Time Trends and Incidents of Reported Memory Concerns and Cognitive Decline, a cohort study in UK primary care, and it was published in the journal Clinical Epidemiology. So the researchers looked at uh, 1.3 million adults between 65 and 99 years old, and this was between 2009 and the end of 2018, so roughly a 10-year period. They found that for every 1,000 people that were observed for a year in 2009, there was one new case of cognitive decline being recorded. By 2018, for every 1,000 people that were observed for a year, there were three new cases of cognitive decline being recorded. So this is a, a tripling in risk from 0.1% to 0.3%, um, but as you'll note, absolute risk is still relatively low. We talked about the difference between absolute and relative risk on the last research review, and we've, we've talked about that before. But in this case, I would argue that the implications are still significant. Although the absolute risk is relatively low, we saw a tripling in that risk. And this study also showed that 46% of people reporting a memory concern and 52% of people reporting cognitive decline would go on to develop dementia within three years. We also know that cases of Alzheimer's disease are rising rapidly, and memory issues and cognitive decline can be early signs of Alzheimer's. So this study and the earlier one about higher rates of prediabetes in teens are, are certainly disturbing, but they can also be viewed as opportunities or wake-up calls. The reality is we know how to address this stuff. We know what to do. We just need to make it a priority and to take action. So... You know, I was hoping with the COVID-19 pandemic that that would spur us forward in this regard because we, we saw during the pandemic that people with diabetes and obesity and other um, chronic conditions were at higher risk of a severe outcome. And I had hoped that that would lead to more public health focus and attention on these chronic lifestyle diseases and, and we'd see a greater effort uh, within the public health infrastructure to address them. Unfortunately, that did not happen there was just a, a lot more focus on the short-term steps that we could take to address the pandemic and not really much focus on the underlying health issues that dramatically increase the, the risk of severe outcomes with COVID-19. Uh, it's up to us now to take those steps forward and studies like the, the one before about the increase in rates of prediabetes in teens and then this one about increase in cognitive decline in elderly people should be that wake-up call, should be that motivation uh, to help us move forward here. Okay, so next study is uh, was really interesting one and it sort of looked at this question, is free time overrated? So it's called Relationships of Leisure, Social Support, and Flow with Loneliness in International Students in Taiwan, Implications During the COVID-19 Pandemic, and was published in Leisure Sciences. So actually what, what the researchers set out to look at in this study is how to mitigate the, the negative impacts of loneliness. Uh, I've talked about the effects of social isolation and loneliness before. In fact, I mentioned it in my first book, uh, The Paleo Cure, loneliness and social isolation are a greater predictor of early death than body mass index, alcohol consumption, and even smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which is just remarkable. I don't think most people are aware of that. Uh, it's certainly not something that com tends to come up in the discussion of the most important factors that determine our health span. Uh, but it definitely is, and, and a lot of researchers in this space are, are, are aware of this. So the, the study authors found that engaging in meaningful, challenging activities during free time can reduce people's loneliness and increase their positive feelings, even if they don't have more social connection during that period. So, so this is like uh, an attempt to answer the question, how can we mitigate the impacts of loneliness when, when social connection isn't available? Um, and this is, of course, an, was an issue during COVID-19 pandemic when a lot of people were locked down and kind of stuck on their own. 
so COVID certainly worsened loneliness and social isolation for a lot of people. And we're now seeing a lot more research in this area. Now, this study kind of challenged the notion that free time is always desirable or optimal. Uh, the researchers found that people who had like meaningful and challenging experiences, even on their own, uh, were less lonely. This doesn't surprise me at all. It definitely fits with my personal experience. I always have something that I'm engaged in and trying to learn and master. Lately, during the winter, that's been skiing. You know, I love skiing, um, but I'm not, you know, and I'm a, I'm not like a ski racer or anything. But I take it pretty seriously, and I, I work with a coach, and you know, I'm, I ski with a friend who takes video of me and. Uh, I take video of him and we send it to our coach and the coach makes a lot of suggestions and I'm always trying to to improve my skiing and that, that keeps me really engaged and it makes it more meaningful and fun. I'm often working on some kind of uh, art-related project, photography, um, you know, creating art for my home. Maybe I'm learning a new musical instrument. Maybe I'm, you know, brush, uh, last last year I was my goal was to um, get back to being fluent in Spanish which I you know I used to be but I've kind of fallen had fallen out of practice so I'm always trying to uh, engage in these kinds of experiences that will help me grow and and I've found just in my in my own life that these just make my life so much better and so I was really interested to see this study uh, because that's exactly what the, the study results found as well. When we're engaged in what we're doing, we enter what psychologists call the flow state. And uh, to achieve a flow state, an activity has to have require a, a pretty good amount of skill. Not so difficult that it's impossible, but it has to really um, demand our attention and require that a, a, a fairly high level of skill. Um, we have to be focused on it, not distracted. Uh, the activity needs to be meaningful in some way, and it will often involve or provoke a sense of timelessness. So we've all experienced this before. Uh, if you're like rock climbing or you're uh, engaged in, in playing music or making a painting or something like that, and we're just surprised or shocked by how much time has passed while we're doing that, that's this flow state. And of course, the activities that induce flow will differ from person to person, uh, but the most common ones are sports or outdoor activities, making art, playing music or writing, um, or routine repetitive activities like chopping wood can also, or, or washing the dishes can also induce a flow state. So I think the message from this study, regardless of, of whether you've been suffering from loneliness actually, but especially if you are, is to regularly do activities that put you in a flow state. And I think this just leads to a life well lived and a more enjoyable and satisfying life, regardless of your social connections. But I think the contribution of this study that's interesting is that even when you're feeling a sense of social isolation, whether it's related to the pandemic or, or something else, these kinds of activities can help increase your life satisfaction even when you're not able to immediately increase those social connections. So uh, really fascinating study and uh, looking forward to seeing more research along these lines. Okay, so the last study for today looked at carcinogens in sunscreen. So summer is coming which means warmer temps and for a lot of us, more time outdoors and more sun exposure. So I wanna be sure you're choosing the, the best and safest sunscreen um, if you're gonna be outside in the sun and, and using sunscreen. So scientists have discovered at least two different compounds in sunscreens that are carcinogens, uh, benzene and benzophenone. The problem is that neither of these compounds appear on product labels, but can be introduced during the manufacturing process or by chemical reactions within the sunscreen. In one study, for example, benzene was found in 43 out of 224 sunscreens and in 8 of 48 after sun products. The FDA itself suggests that no level of benzene is safe and it's not permitted in these or any other products. 
So when products are discovered that contain benzene, then they need to be removed from the market because it's such a potent carcinogen. In fact, uh, I just saw a headline the other day that two popular antiperspirants were just recalled off of the market due to benzene. It was discovered that they contain benzene. Benzene is a, a, a known carcinogen in humans, according to the CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services, the, the World Health Organization, and other regulatory agencies around the world. And so, you know, this is definitely a concern uh, when we see these in sunscreens. But benzene and benzophenone are not the only chemicals of concern in conventional sunscreens, as I've discussed before. UV filters, like oxybenzone, are also problematic. Uh, oxybenzone is a compound that is not stable when it's exposed to UV radiation, which is just bizarre that that would be put in sunscreen because, of course, people are using sunscreen when they're exposed to UV radiation. Oxybenzone forms reactive oxygen species. These are popularly referred to as free radicals and can cause oxidative damage, which is definitely a precursor to cancer. One UV filter, PBSA, has been shown to induce DNA damage in human skin cells after exposure to ultraviolet rays. And beyond the local effects uh, from formation of these free radicals or reactive oxygen species, systemic toxicity is a concern because these UV filters get absorbed into the bloodstream. Our skin is a very porous barrier, which means that you know whatever we put on our skin, we should just assume that it's gonna get absorbed into our blood. From an evolutionary perspective, we didn't really have a reason to evolve a, a very tight, effective skin barrier because we weren't putting stuff on our skin for the vast majority of our of our evolutionary history. Our gut barrier, when it's intact, actually works pretty well in that regard, but our skin does not. So whatever we put on our skin can end up in our bloodstream. That's one of the reasons it's so important to use healthy uh, personal care products. So uh, systemically with these UV filters, one of the primary concerns is their potential for endocrine disruption, hormone imbalances. So there are several animal and in vitro studies that have found adverse uh, developmental and, and reproductive effects of these UV filters. So again, that's uh, important for all of us, but even more important for kids and young people putting you know, these sunscreens um, on our kids as they're still developing their endocrine systems uh, might be especially harmful. So the safest option for sunscreen is one that is like a non-nanoparticle zinc oxide product. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, uh, I'm gonna direct you to the Environmental Working Group uh, website. They have a guide to sunscreens uh, with the the best sunscreens that don't contain these UV filters and benzene and benzophenone and that are uh, zinc oxide based often and don't have nanoparticles. Um, and they're just the, the cleanest, safest products. So Environmental Working Group, we'll put a link uh, to it in the show notes to this Guide to Sunscreens, but you can also just Google Environmental Working Group Guide to Sunscreens, and you should be able to find it. They've also got you know good tips in general on how and when to use sunscreen and how to make good choices when uh, shopping for sunscreen. Okay, everybody, that's it for now. Keep sending your questions in to chriscresser.com slash podcast question, and we'll see you next time. When I find a company that I love and I think you'll love, I do my best to support it and help it grow. Sometimes that means just getting the word out through my podcast, emails, and social media channels, and other times that means investing in the company or joining their advisory board. If you're hearing this message, it means that I'm either an investor or advisory board member of a company that is mentioned in this podcast episode. I only invest in or advise companies with a mission and products that I truly believe in. And I hope you benefit from learning more about them and how their products can improve your life. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. 
I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.